Good morning. Uh, I'm Sanford Eigenbrode, REACH Director and an entomologist in the project. And this morning, this installment of the webinar series will cover the insect pests in dryland cereal systems, reflecting the coverage in advances in dryland farming in the Inland Pacific Northwest Handbook. The first diagram here to introduce the topic shows the wheat system. One way of looking at the wheat system, you can see the soil and the wheat plant in the center. And then above that are a bunch of boxes that represent the biotic factors that can influence production, mostly pests and, and diseases, but some beneficials are listed there. On the bottom, you can see the management and climate inputs that influence productivity. So the topic, today's topic, this seminar, uh, highlighted here are the insects. These are the ones we'll discuss this morning. But all of the rest of it you can find discussed in to various degrees in the in in the advances book. So this is a list of insects that are covered in chapter eleven of advances. Today in this webinar, we'll just do those that are highlighted here, these five. The rest uh, you can read about in advances. We'll start with the cereal aphids. The Northwest has a number of species of aphids that affect uh, wheat production, cereal production systems. There's about a dozen that one can collect in here. The six, the rogues gallery here, are the six important ones right now. Uh, top left, rose grass aphid, middle top English grain aphid, Russian wheat aphid, bird chariot aphid, green bug or Schizaphis graminum, and cereal grass aphid, Metapolophium festuque cerealium. This cereal grass aphid is a new aphid to the species to the uh, Pacific Northwest, a new uh, member of the aphid fauna of North America. Uh, we discovered it in the REACH project, and it is widespread in the region. So a little bit more about that one later. These video clips. Um, help you see, get some search image for some of the more common aphids, uh, the English grain aphid in the top center. This is what they really look like late in the season. These are the red ones you see in the heads. Russian wheat aphid, this football shaped, pale, dusty looking guy on the right. Bird chariot aphid, bottom left, very easy to, to recognize because it's dark. And the cereal grass aphid that I mentioned before, this new one. Here's a video clip of the new aphid blown up so you can get a better look at it. It's pretty nondescript as an aphid, but you can see the staining that accompanies it right here on this very good shot of what the, uh, the aphid does to the plant. So that makes it uh, potentially more injurious. All these aphids have a life cycle that puts them on winter hosts of some kind, either woody hosts or grassy hosts and wheat in the summertime. They go through annual migrations. The sexual phases are on the, on the winter, typically if they have sexual phases, and then they migrate into the wheat. So as they migrate into the meat, that's wheat, that's when we can make our management decisions about them. Some of these species are injurious primarily because they feed on the wheat and others are injurious because they can transmit uh, viruses, especially barley yellow dwarf virus, that m requires more aggressive treatment. This picture of the aphids again, the ones in the orange box here are tran can transmit barley yellow dwarf virus. Uh, those on the right uh, do not. So when we're trying to make decisions about managing aphids, if we suspect viruses present in the system, we have to be quite aggressive to avoid uh, injury. Barley yellow dwarf virus shown here. This is an infest. Uh, this is an infection in southern Idaho. Juliet Marshall took this photograph a few years back. You can see that it can be quite destructive to yield, and it has this appearance. So, for aphid management. Natural enemies are effective at reducing the populations below injurious levels due to direct injury, and there are foliar insecticides available to do that. Seed treatments are 
also registered and much of our wheat these days is planted with neonicotinoid treatments that tend to reduce aphid infestations and may reduce virus spread some. Here are our natural enemies that attack aphids. We got surfid adults and their larvae on the top left and top middle. The top right is a ladybug larva. Then there's a lady, couple ladybird, ladybugs. Uh, there's lace wings um, in the center. That's the adult and the larva is down below that one and then we're parasitic wasps. So these are all good critters that we attempt to preserve when managing aphids. There are some approximate thresholds for aphids when to treat. Uh, these are all direct injury, not related to virus. So English grain aphid or the rose grass aphid have these um, standard recommendations that I think are still applicable. The important thing to note is that um, the number of aphids that trigger treatment uh, starts out relatively low at the pre-head and flowering stage and then goes up because the wheat becomes more tolerant to the aphids. The same thing happens for the Russian wheat aphid and uh, the wheat grass aphid and green bug in that the number of plants and percentage of plants infected um, in the fall and the spring before heading is relatively low and then you can tolerate higher percentages as the, uh, the wheat matures. A way of thinking about it is that the different aphid species out there are have different relative in, uh, levels of injury. So Russian wheat aphid, our new wheat grass aphid and green bug, if they are ones, then English grain aphid is like a, a 0.8, rose grass aphid is 0.7, and bird cherry oat aphid just 0.5, if there's no virus. Climate change can affect insect pests. And we have some data in the Northwest to give us an idea of how that might affect aphids. Uh, this is a um, 20 year suction trap records uh, across the state of Idaho and some in, in Washington of these three aphid species. Our pad eye, the top one, that's the bird cherry oat aphid. Second one is the rose grass, and the bottom one is Russian wheat aphid. You can see they fluctuate a lot, but if we pull the signal out, we can also detect uh, responses to the general warming trend that occurred over this 20 year record, approximately 20 year record. So for example, bird cherry oat aphid on the top tends to fly earlier when as temperatures warm. Rose grass aphid in the middle has not shown any response to changing temperatures in the region and may not change in the future. Russian wheat aphid flies earlier and its abundance is higher on warmer years. So there's one that might be, as climates continue to warm, become more problematic because of that. All this is telling us is we should be vigilant to how these kinds of changes can continue to occur in these systems. I'm gonna switch now to cereal leaf beetle, uh, Olema melanopus. Uh, shown here are on the flanking images, there are two adults and in the middle is the uh, beautiful, well, to some not so beautiful larva. That's a last in star larva. These videos uh, will give you a better idea of what they look like and what they look like in the field. On the left, the larva is climbing up a leaf next to the injury it causes, those strips, their characteristic strips. And on the right, the adult is also, uh, I think there's a little bit of feeding there. The point is that larva and adults produce the same kind of injury. They are on the leaves and they, and they feed like this, producing these strips. This is a video of an affected field in Northern Washington. And you can see this silvery appearance of the crop because many of the leaves have that injury on them. So you see this, it's time to get in there um, or pastime perhaps and, and see if you can uh, locate the insects which might merit some treatment. They're univoltine, meaning they have one generation a year. They overwinter as adults. The adults emerge in March, April, depending on where you are in the Northwest and they start to lay eggs. 
immature. Um, and then the eggs, larvae, and pupae from April to June are present. And then so-called immature adults uh, from July into October. And these then are the ones that overwinter. So we're looking for them right away. We can start to look for eggs early in the season if we suspect there, that there may be um, a problem. You should monitor or sweep for the adults and inspect for the larvae. There are economic thresholds for these. Three eggs or three larvae per tiller before the booting stage and one larva per flag leaf during the remaining growth change stages. So this is kind of reverse of the aphids in that uh, as the plant matures and the flag leaf becomes more important, uh, the threshold goes down. There are nearly 20 registered insecticides for this critter that are effective. And when you're sampling, don't be fooled by the collops beetle, which looks like the cereal leaf beetle. Here's a video of the collops beetle and a still image. You can see it's similar looking. Uh, one way to tell them apart is that the males of the collops beetle have these enlarged nodes on the on the antennae, as you can see here. Another way is uh, to just look at how the thing is moving. The collops beetle is a predator. It's a good guy. So it is it eats all kinds of things, including even mites on the on the on the wheat. And so it's actively foraging as shown here. Here's the beetle, cereal leaf beetle on the left, collops beetle on the right, so that you can uh, I think readily see the difference between them. Cereal leaf beetle is also um, Affected by biological control, a parasitoid, Terosticus julis, has been released in the Northwest um, thanks to efforts by APHIS and WSU Extension. And in most places, this uh, parasitoid is pretty effective with relatively high levels of parasitism uh, last time records were taken. And the effects of the cereal leaf beetle are noticed only in some parts of our region, presumably because this thing is working where it is present. Uh, you should try to protect it if you have cereal leaf beetle by not spraying when the larvae are present because that's when the parasitoid is present, but when the adults are laying eggs, which is the where the parasitoid is not yet present in the system. They come out later to attack those larvae. For climate change, uh, we can make an index of cereal leaf beetle and project how it might change over time to mid-century. This color map shows um, what we've calculated based on well-known data about the cereal leaf beetle and its biology. Under projected warming trends and changing, changes in precipitation patterns, we expect that most of the Northwest will become a better place for the cereal leaf beetle than it is now. On this map, all the numbers, this chart is a change in the index. So po they're all positive numbers. Even a two is a slight increase in uh, suitability of the climate for cereal leaf beetle, and 12 is a lot. And you can see that that's not evenly distributed. In some places, it doesn't change very much, like in Montana. But in northern Idaho, um, on the west coast, on the west side, other, other, other side of the Cascades, and some parts of central Washington, the uh, climate will get better for cereal leaf beetle. This indicates some vigilance on our part. In addition, this here's this, this parasitoid again, and this is a, a model showing percent parasitism currently from 1971 to 2000, using climate data from that window versus mid-century. And the percent parasitism is indicated with a color scale. And you can see the dark red colors are, um, associated with lower percent parasitism and the yellow colors are higher percent parasitism. You can see that currently there's some differences in where we expect parasitism to be high and low, but in the future, um, lower percent parasitism becomes more common. So combining the climate effects on the beetle and the parasitoid would suggest that um, its management will become more challenging. For some of you who don't really worry about it, you may want to be attending to it in the future. Hessian fly is another important pest of wheat in our region. Uh, we have, again, in our region, one generation a year of this fly. Uh, it um, is a pest all over North America. 
and uh, as here as well for the last several decades. Adults, flies or midges like this one, they emerge in the spring, they lay eggs on the plant, um, and um, in five to 10 days, larvae emerge, go down into the um, sheath of the plant where they feed, and they can cause quite a bit of injury there. Uh, their life stages are shown here in a series of little videos. This one on the left, this first one, these are the adults. They just look like midges, but you'll see them like this on the plants. These, this is a pair of mating uh, in a colony at the University of Idaho in Nilsa Bosca Perez's program there. Here are eggs from that colony. You can see um, they are elongate and go in the direction of the, of the um, veins on the leaf. And uh, here are larvae, mid to late instar larvae, down in the sheath of a plant where they're doing their feeding, and uh, the pupae, which are some kind, sometimes called flax seeds because that's what they look like. And this is um, the overwintering stage. So you find these in, in wheat um, later in the season, you might um, be concerned about adults late in the, the following year. Principal means of managing these guys in our part of the world and most parts of the world is through host plant resistance. There are a large number of genes that have been identified that work against particular biotypes of the flies. The video here is showing um, the colonies at the University of Idaho where varieties from Idaho and Washington state breeding programs are screened for resistance to make sure that uh, those that um, are released, especially the spring wheat varieties are resistant to the, to the fly. You should can take, pay attention to that. A little bit uh, on climate change here, at least one of these resistant genes, not one we use, but one elsewhere, is sensitive to warming climates. So we'll have to be vigilant about that um, if that affects the genes that are deployed here. Winter wheat seeded after October 15th is generally not attacked by the fly. Spring wheat after winter wheat is the most vulnerable, as you can imagine, because uh, there can be uh, flaxseed available to release adults into the crop. Crop rotation and destruction of volunteer wheat are helpful for suppressing the fly. The seed treatments, again, that we mentioned previously, are also having some effect effectiveness against the hessian fly, and there are also foliar materials available to be sprayed to try to suppress the flies, the adult flies, not too effective against the larvae. Mites. Uh, several mite species of economic agricultural importance occur in Pacific Northwest cereals. There's four here uh, that we cover in the, uh, in the uh, advances book. The brown wheat mite, the banks grass, grass mite, the winter grain mite, and the wheat curl mite. And on the right are pictures of the brown wheat mite and the banks grass mite, so you can get an idea of their appearance. Sim well, the banks is the green one. It's not as common in wheat as in other grasses, but it can be seen in wheat. And the brown wheat mite, uh, as, uh, these are all, both of these are tiny, so you need a uh, hand lens if you're going to try to see them and recognize them. Uh, the winter grain mite uh, is on the top here. Easy to recognize because of its orange legs and very black iridescent body. And an important one on the bottom right is the wheat curl mite. This one looks different than the other ones. It uh, looks like a, a little pale cigar. It's very tiny. You really can't even see them at all without a hand lens, let alone identify them. So you need to be looking for that, these guys. They are uh, important because they... Um, uh, can transmit virus. But first, uh, about their biology uh, altogether, they, uh, the mites feed on numerous different hosts, including all these grasses in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Fields that have heavy infestations can have a silver or gray coloration, coloration and you can have yield um, losses due to that. Uh, the mites arrive uh, from senescing alternative hosts on wind. So you should be scouting from October to April if you're concerned about mites. And some of them, like the brown 
wheat and the banks grass mites should be scouted later because their infestations can grow later. Infestations often begin near the field margin, but uh, you should sample about the field to make sure you're catching them. You can sometimes see silk or webbing associated with mites before you see the mites. Uh, that will help you uh, in, get an idea that you've got mites. And you can also take samples by shaking leaves over a white piece of paper. Again, hand lens is recommended to identify these things. Uh, a little bit of feeding damage might help to identify them. The brown wheat mite produces finely mottled leaves. The mites can be right up on the plant in the warm days. Banks grass mite can produce bright yellow staining. The winter grain mite is, produces more of the silvering. And of course, the mites are relatively large and dark. And the wheat curl mite produces rolled leaves at the edges. Uh, hence its name, wheat girl mite. Wheat street mosaic virus infections are can lead to heavy losses, and, and uh, the only vector of this virus is the wheat curl mite. It's sometimes accompanied by two other viruses that are also transmitted by the mite. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have um, good insecticides or caricides to apply to control these mites. So you should follow the management recommendations. Um, materials are registered for the brown wheat mite and the winter grain mite, not for the banks mite. So if you're getting direct injury from those guys, you could spray. And look in the Pacific Northwest Handbook for materials. For the wheat curl mite, um, rotations, eliminating volunteer wheat, um, late planting of winter wheat are these cultural control methods that are currently recommended. Wireworms, the last type of pest, uh, insect pest that we'll cover today, um, are important uh, in a lot of crops across the USA. There are lots of species. Uh, we have several here that affect our wheat production systems. They are the larva of click beetles. So this pictures show on the left, this is uh, later instar larva, typical uh, appearance. Middle picture is the ferrate pupa in the soil. And uh, right picture is one of the species um, as an adult. They're usually most abundant in fields that have been planted to grasses, grains, or, or to sod for several years. And the species that are present on your farm are likely dependent on where you are. There are six species listed here, sugar beet, wireworm, western field wireworm, Pacific coast wireworm, green wireworm, and there's some other genera that occur here. Adults emerge during the spring and early summer and lay eggs on the surface of the soil. Soon after hatching, the larvae move within the soil and locate the seedlings by smell. But what's important about these guys is that they can live for many years in the soil as for some as many as 11 years as larvae. So this oviposition stage is interesting, but more important, you can have populations that persist in the soil as larvae for many years. Um, in the field, the damage is typically patchy, may look like a bad seed patch or something. Um, but if you look at individual plants and see dead leaves or dead tillers, dig the plants up and you are likely to find um, or if you have wireworms, you'll find them, as shown here in this picture, right down there at the base of the plant feeding. Sampling, uh, random sampling in the field is recommended. Um, solar bait traps are preferred, much more efficient if, you're, if you've got time to set these traps than just digging to look for them. Consists of a mixture of germinated soaked wheat and corn seeds buried um, in the loosely covered with soil and then covered with dark plastic to warm it up. The warm conditions then produce a local source of CO2 moisture and volatiles that the wireworms are attracted to. And then you can dig the traps up and find out um, what you've got. One to two per trap indicates that uh, treatments would be merited in your field. Uh, Aaron Esser uh, is the expert on this, on these um, 
on these on wireworms in our region and has published on them. And I'll give you some more links to material from Aaron Esser about these. Use about 10 traps a field because of their patchiness. This is a, uh, there's a couple of YouTube videos available uh, to help you um, learn how to set these solar traps. Uh, this is Ivan Milosevic, who was a, a PhD student at WSU. And there are the links to those YouTubes. You should look at them, uh, make it very easy to set these traps. Rotating out of wheat can reduce wireworm populations because we have several species, but they really are grass feeders, so you can break that. If seed, if the soil is well packed, it'll support um, healthy and vigorous plant growth, but also limit wireworm movement because they have to go through the soil. So well packed soil can limit their capacity to reach your seedlings. Repeated years of no-till planting, adversely, can cause uh, increases in wireworm damage. Uh, the main treatment for these guys is the seed applied neonicotinoids. Um, I really don't have any other way of getting down in the soil to treat them. Uh, this seems to keep them from feeding, but doesn't necessarily reduce the population. So um, it's uncertain now, but it does not seem that you can get that kind of population reduction with neonicotinoids. You just have to use them as a, an annual a preventative. More information again here on the WSU Wheat and Small Grains website and Aaron X Esser's um, YouTube um, should be consulted as, it, as well as looking at advances and reading the whole section there. Wireworms and climate change. I don't know much about it, but we do know that our um, wireworms are not everywhere. We have different species prevalent in different parts of the region. On this map, you can see these pie charts showing you where the, uh, the different wheat and the wireworm species occur. And those seem to be associated with soil moisture, with um, Limonius infuscatus and Limonius californicus in the wetter places. We do know that the um, climate change models forecast wetter soils uh, in our region going forward, which might um, be associated with movements of the Limonius californicus and infuscatus into other parts of the region. That could be important because at least now those two seem to be harder to control with insecticides than the others. We'll have to be vigilant, as I've been saying throughout this webinar. The Insect Management Handbook is your go-to document, of course, to find out what materials are registered and uh, their application protocols. <clears throat> Please consult that. Uh, our um, advances book does not uh, provide those kind of recommendations. We point you to the Insect Management Handbook because it's updated every year and it's current. I'd like to acknowledge for this um, particular webinar the input from all of these folks who uh, contributed to the chapter on insect management, Ed Baczynski, Neil Sabolska Perez, Dave Crowder, Arash Rashad, Sylvia Rondon, Bradley Stokes, and Stephen Odebe from all of our three universities, University of Idaho, WSU, and, U and Oregon State University, and to the production team here um, at WSU doing the webinars. Of course, this has been supported by the REACH Project, a uh, NIFA-funded project. For more information, go into Advances in Dryland Farming and consult this book, uh, consult Chapter 11, where you can read about these pests and others in more detail. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Advances in Dryland Farming System series. Uh, this webinar will be addressing integrated weed management. My name is Ian C. Burke, and I'm a weed scientist here at Washington State University. My presentation will be addressing weed biology to begin with. Knowledge of the biology of, of weed pests is critical for uh, effective integrated weed management. Uh, the presentation will work through the important integrated management tools that we have for managing weeds, uh, including some discussion of herbicides, and then we'll talk about how to and the process you need to use to develop a weed management plan. Weeds are primarily annual 
of species. That is, they uh, germinate, emerge, and set seed in a single uh, growing season. Uh, although we, some of our more problematic weed species are definitely uh, perennial species, the majority of our, our weed pests are annuals. And that life cycle is, is presented here, uh, where uh, the seed uh, present in the seed bank uh, form the, the foundation and, and a protective uh, buffer for uh, activities above ground. The seed uh, generally germinate and emerge usually with the crop or just after the crop. And it's in that period of time that we uh, are actively trying to manage them. If we fail, ultimately that can cause uh, crop interference where there's some measurable yield loss due to the competition with the weeds. And ultimately the weed uh, is out to set seed. It's the, you know, the measure of any weed success it's, is, is its ability to reproduce. Uh, so the uh, plants will produce seed and uh, drop their seed in a process we call seed rain. Uh, so an inherent in any um, understanding of the pest, uh, the weed biology is a knowledge of and operational uh, management of the seed bank. Uh, to manage the seed bank uh, or to think about seed bank principles, uh, it's, it's important to understand that uh, weeds are uh, like all biological organisms, highly in tune with their environment. And so germination processes uh, that govern weed germination and emergence uh, include a whole host of uh, factors, including resources and soil conditions. The, the weeds usually have inherent biological characteristics that uh, may prevent germination even when presented with the ideal conditions. We call that seed dormancy. Uh, also present in the soil uh, matrix are a whole host of predators, including uh, 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 insects and diseases that might prey on weed seed. Uh, ultimately, uh, a vast majority of the weed seed present in the seed bank are usually lost to decay uh, and embryo death over time. And so management of the seed bank has become a critical emphasis in any sort of uh, management program. Reducing the amount of seed that returns to the seed bank should be an imperative of any sort of integrated weed management strategy. Uh, we know a lot about uh, the, the duration weed seed lasts in the seed bank. Uh, this slide um, is, gives some assessment of, of the important weed species found in the inland Pacific Northwest, uh, separated by uh, grasses and broadleaves. Uh, and you can see that many of our grass species have a very short duration uh, in the seed bank, often no more than three or four years before there's a really uh, visible difference in the, in the amount of um, weed seed germinating grasses just don't last very long in the seed bank. Uh, if you're successful in managing them uh, over that very short period of time and you uh, eliminate any sort of seed deposits into the seed bank, usually you can, you can observe a measurable reduction in the, in the infestation you have in your fields. Broadleaves, though, uh, have quite a bit more variation. Some of our most common weed species, like common lamb's quarters uh, and mayweed chamomile, can persist in the seed bank for a decade or more. And it's thought that lamb's quarters um, some lamb's quarter seed can persist as, for as long as 100 years. So uh, those sorts of weeds, uh, once you, they become established, often are a problem for uh, your entire career. Ultimately, the, the emphasis of, of seed bank management is reducing seed persistence, weed seed persistence, and reducing the safe sites or eliminating the safe sites for the germination and emergence. Uh, what you wind up with is a, a conceptual framework that um, uh, looks like this, where uh, there's a, because of management inputs and practices, management of the seed bank, there's a reduction in the viable seed present in the seed bank over time. Uh, thus, uh, reducing the, hopefully reducing the amount of uh, energy and effort expended later after you've uh, uh, managed the seed bank to extinction. Uh, and in fact, it, uh, when we look historically over uh, multiple decades, we can see changes in the um, weed seed weed composition in fields because of changes in management practices. So next on the list is reducing weed establishment. Uh, there are a whole host of processes that govern germination, emergence, and, and survival of weeds, uh, again, including resources, in particular light and fertility. Uh, those often govern uh, germination and emergence to a large degree for many of our weed species. Also uh, critical are the seed size, and that plays a role in how deep the weed seed can germinate and emerge, and emerge successfully, uh, the depth at which they can germinate and emerge successfully, and also uh, surface residues play a large role in, in the weed's ability to, to survive that germination and establishment process. Uh, 
Also active in, in this period of time uh, potentially are uh, predators and pathogens. Just like our crop species, we have there are pathogens that affect uh, many of our weed species. And so uh, the guiding principles for reducing weed establishment, uh, although they usually include conventional inputs that we're going to discuss here in a minute, but could also include stimulation of uh, processes that would uh, mitigate their survival uh, in that germination process. So ultimately, you, um, uh, you get a graph that looks a little bit like this. So there's a, a reduction in weed seedling establishment over time uh, so that the numbers of weeds that you are dealing with on, a, on any given time period are reduced or any given season are reduced. Uh, the final process I'll discuss uh, in, in terms of biology is the, the interference of the weed with the crop. Uh, weeds are uh, usually what we would call luxury users of resources. Uh, they use far more resources than they're capable of, of turning into yield. Our crops have been um, specifically bred to be efficient users of, re re users of resources. Uh, weeds are not. And so they, we have a tendency to see that them use uh, far more nitrogen at a time when uh, the crop is really uh, in need of, of those resources, and that can have a real impact on yield. And so uh, resources and soil conditions, relative time of emergence, the use efficiency of the resources, uh, all can play a role in, in how weeds compete with, with the crop and reduce yield. Uh, also governing that process is biomass allocation. Uh, weeds are uh, prolific in their growth and can produce a large amount of biomass in a very short period of time. In our water limiting environment here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, every um, a bit of moisture is critical for above ground growth of our crops and weeds are uh, very efficient at uh, removing water uh, early in the season before the crops really begin to, to produce the yield that we would like to harvest. And so management of, of weeds in that critical period is, is essential for protecting yield. So ultimately you get a conceptual framework that looks a little bit like this, where you have crop yield loss on the vertical axis and weed density on the horizontal axis. And by reducing yield weed density uh, uh, by whatever means necessary, uh, ultimately can protect yield uh, in the field season. Like uh, other crop pests, uh, weed scientists have developed critical periods for management of, of weeds. Uh, they're not uh, used as broadly or as widely as uh, what they would be for insect pests, primarily because uh, weeds are so destructive. Uh, the density required to cause a yield loss in uh, many of our crop species is often on the order of one um, weed per, per 10 square yards or even less. And so uh, the guiding principles for management of weeds is you have to manage weeds every year. And there's no uh, density that um, would maybe stimulate an input. One of the uh, few weed management periods that I've, or management periods I've found that be particularly useful is the critical period of weed control, and that's um, uh, uh, pictured here, where there's a very specific critical period during the crop growth and development where it's highly sensitive to weed interference. Weeds present in the crop before that time or after that time usually don't cause a yield loss. Weeds present during that critical period do cause a yield loss. And so that becomes uh, a very good uh, and handy threshold for timing of inputs to manage weeds. Keeping your crop weed free during that critical period is essential for protecting as much yield as possible. It becomes less of an uh, issue uh, before and after that critical period. The critical period can be um, articulated in a lot of different ways. Um, almost all of us are real comfortable working in the Julian calendar. Of course, crops and weeds work on um, primarily heat units, and that's uh, exhibited here by growing degree days. But there's also uh, provided here uh, several different growth stage measurements for uh, wheat. And in this instance, this is for winter wheat. Uh, spring wheat and other spring crops would have critical periods that would occur not long after planting and would end often several to many weeks afterward, depending on how competitive those particular crops are. Reducing or potentially eliminating the crit critical period of weed control is a primary emphasis of integrated weed management as well. So uh, that brings me to weed management specifically. And I'm going to begin with the toolbox. Many of uh, 
uh, the producers I work with uh, can readily identify uh, multiple items on this as being critical for just good crop growth and development. Basic agronomy is a key and essential ingredient for integrated weed management. So anything you can do to make that crop more competitive uh, will ultimately uh, improve your weed management. So things like row spacing, seeding rate, planting date, crop cultivar even uh, plays an important role. Uh, the, the biggest uh, impact is usually due to crop rotation, but uh, other inputs like uh, mulches, our fertility management, and uh, increasing in, in, increasingly we're seeing interest in cover crops can also play a role in, in integrated weed management. In addition to that, uh, there's mechanical weed management, uh, including primary and secondary tillage. Primary tillage usually is thought of as the tillage that occurs uh, in preparation to plant your crop, but it also can have a profound impact on the seed bank, particularly if you use inversion tillage. Uh, and you're capable of burying the seed um, to a depth where it can't germinate and emerge. Uh, secondary tillage is primarily thought of as, as the tillage we um, use to manage weeds, uh, either before or during um, crop growth and development, uh, and uh, to a certain extent, flaming or burning uh, is also thought of as a mechanical weed management input. And then there's the chemical weed management, uh, I think, uh, everyone understands what the role of herbicides are. I'm not going to um, spend much time talking about them specifically uh, because there's a wealth of resources for those, but chemical weed management, of course, is the, the primary means we use to manage weeds. Uh, but integrated weed management includes all these other strategies and chemical weed management um, working together in concert to provide the, the most uh, efficient weed management possible. Just to give you a, a few examples of how the impact of some of those cultural inputs how impactful those cultural inputs can be for weed management. Uh, this slide shows the, the crop growth and development just 16 days after planting. This is winter wheat. Uh, and the winter wheat was planted at two different densities. So at a 50% of the seeding rate, a typical seeding rate here in the high rainfall zone of the inland Pacific Northwest, um, you can see that there's a significant amount of, of soil showing through that wheat canopy. Uh, compared to what the canopy looks like when we um, seed at about 125 percent of the typical seeding rate, or nearly 150 pounds per acre. And uh, ideally what you want to do is uh, develop crop growth, or um, work to have crop growth and development as uh, rapidly as possible to shade the ground. Uh, many of our weed species are highly sensitive to uh, light and can sense light and uh, reducing or eliminating light penetration to the soil surface can reduce or eliminate seed germination and emergence. So that brings me to a broad view of the integrated weed management um, systems I'm going to um, discuss today uh, and a conceptual framework for a view of that uh, integrated weed management system that incorporates uh, both crop, um, all those cultural inputs I've just discussed, including crop um, spacing, crop population, and cultivar, uh, in addition to uh, planting date and ultimately crop rotation. Crop rotation is by far the most effective way to manage weeds uh, because of the changes on a year-to-year -year cycle as exhibited here in our wheat pulse and then a, a legume, forage legume rotation. Uh, the changes on a yearly basis uh, make it very difficult for weeds to adapt to a particular system. So it's quite common for an integrated weed management system to include a rotation where a, a grass crop is rotated to a broadleaf crop uh, and in more integrated systems include uh, uh, forage systems like this, for example, where in addition to the crop rotation that's going on, there's also uh, an incorporation of, of different inputs for management, including, in this case, mowing, as indicated by these small red um, tractors. When you sum all those uh, inputs up, um, the crop rotation, the canopy developed by that crop as indicated by the, the multicolored bars, the herbicides applied, the tillage applied, um, what you want to see is a wide diversity of inputs and timings um, throughout the season. Uh, that makes uh, it very difficult for weeds to adapt to the system you're um, deploying. Inherent in any of this system is an understanding that, you've, that a herbicide pictured here or a tillage event pictured here would also be uh, uh, changeable, and so you would not want to depend on just any one particular
kind of herbicide or kind of tillage, there would be uh, flexibility and change built into the system as well. I'll go through just a couple of examples of common systems here in the inland Pacific Northwest. This is a slide that shows the wheat fallow rotation uh, and a uh, summation of the, the events that occur as part of that uh, wheat fallow rotation. Of course, the fallow period is uh, a period where we rely on rainfall and our excellent soils to accumulate enough moisture to grow the, uh, the crop the following season. And it's, a, it's definitely a risk avoidance mechanism. Uh, it also allows us to apply a, a number of different inputs when there's no crop present. And so the system, even though we're only monocropping every other year, is actually uh, re relatively integrated because of the variation of, of inputs we can apply in the fallow year. And this particular example is a chem chemical fallow system uh, where there's very little tillage deployed. Um, in this instance, the tillage that I've got pictured here might be considered maybe a, a residue management, um, but not a deep tillage. Uh, and li there's likely a significant amount of disturbance going on at planting um, to pr prepare uh, or use a deep fallow or deep furrow uh, planting system. Ultimately, when you sum that up, you can see that there's a lot of variation in the timing of herbicide inputs within season. Uh, there's usually a very rapid canopy development because it's a winter crop. Um, winter wheat is very competitive with weeds. And so uh, there's a lot of opportunity here for varying the inputs that occur uh, outside of the cropping system, outside of the, the actual growth of the crop. That compares rather interestingly to um, perhaps a little bit more intensive system that would occur at a, in the intermediate or high rainfall zone where uh, we're potentially growing a spring um, wheat, a spring pulse, uh, likely a, a potentially even a winter wheat, uh, but maybe we're rotating that with a, a forage legume like alfalfa. And in this instance, you can also see that there's a, a wide diversity of inputs occurring throughout the season, uh, tillage, herbicide inputs, mowing events occur in a way that make it very difficult for any one weed species to adapt to this particular system. Of course, that also assumes that there's change going on uh, in the herbicide programs as well um, to make sure you're using a diversity of inputs. It's pretty easy to assess the risk of, of herbicide resistance. Herbicide resistance has been a, a growing problem in our region uh, for many years because of our over-reliance on herbicides. Uh, traditional thinking uh, was that we needed to rotate our herbicide modes of action. But recent research has identified that in fact what we need to be doing is applying um, two or more herbicide modes of action on a particular weed species, uh, either in a systems approach or in a, in a mixture together. Um, they, there needs to be more than one mode of action for management of that particular weed species. In some instances, particularly for our grass weeds like downy Roman Italian ryegrass, there's enough resistance out there that it may well be not possible to, to do that given the current state of our herbicide technology. But you can see here on this chart that you can um, assess your potential uh, for developing herbicide resistance by asking some very simple questions. Are you um, in a system where you've got both cultural and mechanical methods of weed management that are also uh, very active on a particular weed species, or are you over-reliant and, and only managing weeds with chemicals alone. In that last example where you're only using chemicals alone, you'd likely develop uh, herbicide resistance quite quickly. If you're using the same herbicide mode of action year after year, um, or in this, many times in the same season, you're likely to um, also be at a high risk for herbicide resistance development. Uh, if you're using uh, limited or no rotation, you're also at very high risk. So deploying as many different potential uh, crop rotations as you can, or understanding how to incorporate diversity in, in that very simple wheat fallow system is also critical. One of the aspects of herbicide resistance I've discovered here in the Pacific Northwest is that uh, many of us are quite unaware of what mode of action um, or what the current status of our herbicide resistance is. And so if you have questions about whether or not you have herbicide resistance, um, it's possible to have that tested at multiple, in multiple places. And it's definitely worth reaching out to your extension specialist or to myself to have that, um, that weed potentially tested.
Another good indicator of whether or not your, your risk of developing resistance would be uh, whether or not you have a very high weed infestation. Uh, it's definitely a numbers game for, herbis for herbicide resistance in weeds. The more weeds that are exposed to an input, the, le the greater the likelihood they are to, in a, to adapt to it. And so maintaining your weeds at a very low level, um, a very low population is, is important. And uh, in general, if you are not achieving effective control or management of a weed species uh, using a herbicide input where it used to really work well is usually a very good sign that you've got a potential issue. So that brings me to uh, a, the process of developing a weed management plan. Um, it's a four-step process that involves uh, the preliminary steps of identifying the weed, uh, mapping where the weeds occur, and working to identify preventative strategies for um, managing weeds. The next step would be uh, identifying control options, taking advantage of all those tools that we have in the toolbox to manage weeds. Uh, usually there's a, a systems development process that goes on where um, different inputs are chosen for different reasons or how well they fit into a system. And, uh, Important questions need to be asked there, like what can be done or what should be done about the particular weed species that occur in your system. And then finally, the last step in um, developing weed man management plan is the actual system imp implementation. And that should include um, careful record keeping and evaluation of the, of the um, management on a regular basis. So I'll spend a little bit more time talking about um, each of these individual aspects. Uh, when it comes to problem diagnosis, um, knowing your weed species is very critical. Um, knowing where the weeds are and mapping them is very critical. Uh, but also inherent in that is understanding of the, the soils that you're working with. Uh, texture, soil conditions, the colloidal components, um, pH can all play a role in understanding what tools you may be able to deploy, particularly um, tools like herbicides. Uh, these soil um, attributes can play a large role in how persistent many of our herbicides are and could potentially um, cause a, some limitation or a reduction in flexibility. So knowing um, what you've got in terms of soil is, is critical in addition to those other attributes. Uh, also important in diagnosing your problem is the, an understanding of the potential for soil erosion. Uh, in the, last 30 years we made great strides in reducing or, or eliminating uh, soil erosion um, using relatively innovative um, minimum till or no-till systems uh, but uh, that's also reduced our reliance on tillage for weed management and so understanding um, how different tillage inputs might or might not um, increase the propensity for soil erosion is a critical factor for choosing whether or not to to not use tillage at all. Uh, also inherent uh, in a decision process is understanding what kind of non-target species and limitations you might have um, in terms of being able to deploy a particular uh, input. Herbicides are, are known to potentially move off target and understanding, uh, understanding how that process works and working to mitigate or eliminate it uh, is critical as well. Once uh, you have a good sense for what the problems are and you've diagnosed the problems well enough and, and are, have a good sense for what the limitations might be for your particular environment, uh, you can begin to itemize the important tools you would be using to manage weeds. Uh, of course, inherent in that are uh, many decisions you would normally make uh, in the process of growing crops, like choosing good competitive crop varieties, uh, choosing a planter that has a row spacing that would uh, also contribute to weed competition or crop competition with the weeds. Uh, all of those work together, but there's also conscious uh, um, decisions that you need to make, like picking a good, clean uh, seed to plant, using good, clean equipment, uh, making sure that you're aware of what's going on on adjacent um, sites and understand the mobility of some of these weed species. Um, isolating uh, potential new infestations in a way that um, mitigates their spread by cleaning your equipment and prioritizing which fields you enter and, and exit. All of those play a role. The most important cultural input is crop rotation. So uh, being able to plan your crop rotations and, and um, doing so with the knowledge you have the flexibility to, to rotate uh, successfully is, is a critical part of, of the management plan, particularly when you're 
choosing herbicides that might potentially limit your, herbic your crop rotation. Mechanical control, of course, is an um, uh, uh, important aspect and one of the critical components of an integrated weed management system. Uh, there are a number of producers who have chosen to um, not till, and in general, when um, you move to a minimum or no-till system, there should be a conscious effort to find other mechanisms to manage those weeds uh, in the absence of that tillage, or at least knowledge that you need to be flexible and potentially deploy tillage in strategic, at strategic times um, to manage a particularly damaging pest. Uh, and then finally, uh, there's the decision to use herbicides, and th that should um, be done with, with good knowledge of what those herbicides are and what they might mean for your system. So I'll go through uh, some thoughts on program selection. Uh, when you're uh, designing a man weed management plan, of course, you've got to be able to have the ability to do that. You've got to have the equipment to deploy a particular input, be it tillage or a, a pesticide. You've got to have the operational capability. Uh, if you have too much going on at any one time, you may not be very timely on a, a particular input. And so having the, the operational capability to deploy a input is, is a critical assessment. And some of that uh, assessment should include whether or not you need a, a custom service of some sort uh, to manage those pests as timely as possible. Time, I've discovered for many of our large growers, is, is a very limiting factor. And uh, understanding and knowing uh, where your limitations are and trusting others to manage a particular aspect of your uh, weed management plan is an important consideration. I can't overemphasize the, the value of early season programs in weed management. Uh, we have a tendency to apply our herbicides a little too late. We wait for those weeds to germinate and get um, as many as possible to germinate. And as a consequence, uh, we're applying some of our inputs when the weeds are likely not as susceptible as they would have been if we had been uh, more timely. And so, uh, one of the ways we can adjust that um, and give ourselves a little bit more flexibility is to use um, a pre-emergent herbicide that would uh, reduce or eliminate or at least uh, forestall the germination and emergence of weed species until a time that uh, we have a little bit more flexibility in our system to manage them later. So early season programs should and, and do play a critical role for weed management by allowing you to be a little bit more timely in your operations. And of course, it goes without saying that uh, economics play a large role in many of the decisions you'll make uh, when you're developing a weed management plan. Uh, herbicides, in particular, are among the most expensive inputs that growers face on any given season, uh, rivaling that of, of the uh, fertility inputs. And so understanding how to um, take advantage of and, and maximize the benefit of all those inputs that you're already paying for, like those cultural inputs like seed and, and uh, and crop row spacing, making sure that those are working as uh, efficiently and as effectively as possible before adding the herbicide systems and um, usually will, uh, you'll usually see a return on the investment of, of getting those, those inputs maximized. Uh, finally, there's the program execution. Uh, getting your operations out at the right time is, is very critical. Uh, waiting for uh, or forestalling inputs uh, or managing too much at any one time can and often does cause uh, reduction in weed management. Uh, critical, it's very critical that uh, the timing is uh, observed as, as much as possible. Making sure your equipment's functioning right as it should on a regular basis, keeping it um, operational and well calibrated is, is really very critical for operations, uh, including those herbicide applications, but also including uh, you know, effective uh, seed placement in the soil by your planter and a host of other processes that um, need to happen uh, that are important for crop growth and development. Uh, you also need to be prepared to evaluate your method. It's always important to reflect on what um, the effectiveness was on a particular input. Uh, and just because an input fails on a, uh, any given season, uh, you should be um, willing to and and flexible enough to try and understand why it might have failed and be willing to reevaluate it uh, in a different way. And so what we uh, often recommend is that uh, if there's a particularly new input you're going to try out that you don't um, deploy it on a widespread basis, uh, 
that you're prepared to experiment and understand how to um, gain the most out of that new input on a smaller scale before deploying it on a widespread basis. Effectiveness is very important. Uh, consistency and outcome is also very important. So if uh, you have a, a particular input that uh, you have found to be very consistent over the years, but the consistency is reducing or declining over time, uh, then there's usually a really good reason to go in and understand why that um, consistency is declining. A, a consistency in outcome where you have a, a very high level of, of, of weed control uh, is very important, and if you see that change, you need to be prepared to understand why it's changing. Of course, uh, any input should have a fit within, an, within your individual system. If uh, uh, you're not capable of deploying the input or it um, doesn't fit because it limits potentially your crop rotation, then you should be uh, prepared to uh, understand and manage around that limitation. Fit is, is also very criti critical. Uh, the flexibility you might have or might gain by using a, potential, a particular input is also uh, critical to evaluate. As I indicated before, pre-emergent herbicides can also can, in some circumstances, increase your flexibility by uh, delaying weed emergence later in the spring, and so it might allow you to have more flexibility in the timing of post-emergence herbicide applications. As an example of how uh, certain inputs can increase your flexibility, and of course, it's always important to understand and know how your past weed management systems uh, worked and what those results were. Uh, again, it's about being reflective and understanding what works, what doesn't, what you might be able to get by uh, without, and what is critical. All of that uh, plays a role in your method evaluation as you design a weed management plan. So putting all four of those elements together into a weed management plan where you have preliminary steps and are, are actively working to understand the problem, where you identify the control, uh, options for that particular uh, weed, you develop a system to manage that weed, and then implement that system. All should be occurring with, with, uh, with the knowledge that you need to be flexible and, and be uh, thoughtful and reflective on, on how the system is working, and be prepared to, to do things that, uh, that need to be done. So some final thoughts. It's important to be realistic. Uh, you don't have to control all the weeds all the time to be successful. Uh, there's a uh, growing uh, consensus within the weed science discipline that uh, we really probably should be having a zero tolerance for, uh, for seed production, uh, but that doesn't necessarily um, mean that you have to control the weed. Knowing that you've successfully managed weed seed production uh, as best as possible does not necessarily mean you've completely killed all the weeds. So being realistic about the outcome is, is critical. So an inherent in, in the scientific approach is really a sensible and realistic attitude about weeds and the degree of weed management that a system or a new existing technology might provide. So keep these generalizations in mind. Uh, crop growth is always the primary goal. There is uh, no better weed management uh, input than a good competitive crop. And everything you can do to make that crop as competitive as possible uh, will increase uh, your weed control. Uh, once a weed is established, it's probably going to be a problem for a, a long period of time because they, the weed seed can persist for some years in the seed bank. Uh, so if a new weed is appearing on your property or in your fields, uh, understanding and reacting as rapidly as possible to mitigate uh, its ability to spread uh, on into your property is critical. Once it's there, it's going to be a, a potential problem for the rest of your career. Uh, a single application of anything won't control all the weeds all the time. Uh, there is no silver bullet. Uh, you've got to be uh, cognizant that there are weeds that are out there adapting to a particular input, and you've got to have a diversity of inputs uh, managing your weeds uh, to be successful in weed management. Uh, a program with several stages or approaches is often uh, quite a bit more effective than a more simple program. Uh, so uh, even though I've given a few examples of pretty integrated systems, uh, over-reliance on the same herbicide plan or the same herbicide system year after year is, is not a good weed management approach. And uh, you need to have uh, 
uh, potentially several different timings of herbicides, for example, and several additional inputs, uh, including mechanical uh, approaches to manage weeds. The more complex the program in general, the more effective it is. And in general, elimination of any one practice often necessitates the replacement with another. Uh, so if you've uh, decided to reduce or eliminate tillage in your system, understand that you've placed a much heavier burden on your herbicide programs for management. Uh, herbicides, uh, because of the development of herbicide resistance, herbicides are, should be viewed as a technology that will eventually fail. And being uh, practical and pragmatic and understanding that you may have to incorporate some amount of tillage at some point uh, is critical. Uh, I'll reemphasize that there's no new transformative herbicide technology coming along. Uh, the number of herbicide patents has been in steady decline since the advent of, of transgenic um, of glyphosate resistant crops. And uh, the expectation that a new herbicide or new herbicide system coming along and, and helping uh, should be just be viewed as a potential stopgap and understand that these technologies have a, a lifespan and managing your program with as much other inputs as possible to mitigate uh, weeds adapting to the herbicides you're using is a critical part of the integrated management plan. And finally, uh, do try and keep in mind that you will eventually select for a weed that can survive in your management program. Uh, unless that program is dynamic and flexible. So I encourage you to be as dynamic and as flexible as possible in thinking through how to manage these weed species uh, using the, the tools I provided here. Thank you. Um, so first we had a question, is the aphid suction trap data publicly available in near real time as a monitoring tool? I wish I could say yes. Uh, the historic data is available. <clears throat> we have published on it, and uh, I have them. And I have them can make them available. We're still working with those data, but uh, much of the network is not operational now. Um, the costs of maintaining it prevented it from uh, being continued. It would be a great idea to restart that, and uh, have have been trying to. Um, they'll get some ways to, to get that going. So, apologies to that questioner. <laughs> Good question. Um, we also had one, are there biological predators of hessian fly that could be used for biocontrol of this pest? Oh, I think host plant resistance is the way to go. Direct answer there. All right, and we'll do one quick. We have another one here. Um, these insects feed only on living material? Question mark. So is that their only living plant? Which ones? I'm sorry. Uh, it says these insects. I think in general, do any of these feed on on dead plant material or just the living plant? All living plants. All the ones I talked about feed on living plants. Great. So we have a couple more questions. Um, I think this one was actually sort of answered, but let's review it again. How can no-till farming practices cope with the associated effects of promoting the buildup of soil habitat pests? You know, that's actually a subject of a recent grant effort I have uh, been awarded. Uh, one of the most problematic data gaps we face is a, a real limited understanding of, of um, that accumulated ecosystem that, that arises as a cause of, as a, because of no-till systems. And so we don't, I don't know that we necessarily have a, a simple one size fits all answer to that question. I think, you know, I think it, you've got to be prepared to be flexible and understand that we may not know how all these pests are working together in that, that accumulated ecosystem we've created as a result of walking away from tillage. And for example, um, in the case of, in a, in a legume system where P leaf weevil is a problem, we have pretty good data showing that reduced tillage reduces the abundance of that pest and its capacity to reproduce in the soil is diminished in no-till. The reason for that is unknown. There's an awful lot of ecology going on in that soil that uh, we still need to unpack a little bit to understand it. So I guess another part of the answer is that it's mixed. It's not that no-till necessarily exacerbates everything. Uh, there's different kinds of ecological effects associated with no-till. Um, 
getting down in the soil and learning more about the, the working, the, the soil ecosystem is a kind of a frontier in agroecology and uh, it's one we're working in. Good question. So the next question is, does the overseeding of wheat in order to shade the soil and reduce wheat emergence also have the converse impact of excessive use of available soil moisture and nutrients? So the answer to that question is, is most definitely yes. Uh, there's a fine balance between um, uh, seeding for uh, increased canopy and um, overseeding so much that you cause uh, a, sort of a resource limiting situation. And you can sort of see that reflected in the various systems we have in, in the Pacific Northwest where we have a much wider row spacing in the drier areas and a narrow row spacing in the, the high rainfall zone and a gradation between. And so uh, there's uh, everything's working together in that sort of system, row spacing and planting density. Uh, but there's definitely too much seed, um, just like there perhaps is too little. Uh, and often what I encourage um, producers to do, no one wants to go out and change their row spacing. That's usually set when you buy the equipment. Uh, but you can definitely uh, modify that seeding rate and there's an active a bit of research going on looking at just changing seeding rate as you go over um, different slopes and aspects on a field because we know that it's likely the population, the optimum population for interference with weeds um, or competitiveness and optimizing yield is um, different as you move across a field. And so uh, I see a, a change in our equipment in that way in the future. All right, the next question are, what are the planting buffer spacing requirements to eliminate or reduce pollen drift in cases where one farmer plants a GMO herbicide resistant cultivar in the proximity of other farms that are not using that GMO cultivar? Uh, um, I have to confess, I don't necessarily know the answer to that question. That one of the, uh, my colleagues down at Oregon State University, Carol Mallory Smith has been working on that very particular problem uh, because of the, the uh, how important that issue is in the Willamette Valley. And so uh, I think that uh, what she's finding is that uh, pollen can move quite a distance and um, and that buffer or offset uh, might not be achievable, uh, particularly if your neighbors are you're growing in adjacent fields. And so we tend to think of uh, you know herbicide buffers as, as these small little 50 or 100 yard buffer strips and pollen buffers might actually be quite a bit um, longer, but I'm not an expert in that particular area. All right. Um, we also had a request to get a copy of these PowerPoints. Uh, Stanford, how do you want to handle that? Oh, um, I'll have to think about that. You know, everybody's aware that these uh, are, uh, the, the webinars are available for review. Uh, I think for individual slides or PowerPoints that someone is interested in, they should contact the individual um, presenter out of the series. So. For the insect one, for me, I'm happy to uh, entertain those requests from individuals. I think that's the best way to handle that. Um, another question, your toolbox leaves out the use of grazing, browsing, small or large ruminants, for example, goats, why? I, you know, um, animal integration is also an area of, of interest, I know, among uh, producers as well as uh, researchers. Uh, but it's not widely, widely practiced in, in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, there's certainly amount of uh, a growing interest in that uh, and it's actively practiced in areas like Oklahoma uh, where they have a, a very good um, integrated cattle wheat grazing system but uh, we do know that in general that tends to reduce yield when you graze regardless of whether it's in the fall or the spring and uh, and I, it's my sense that many of the larger um, wheat growers aren't necessarily interested in managing animals uh, we've taken out a lot of a lot of fence in the inland Pacific Northwest, uh, so it's definitely an important input, um, but it's not one that uh, I see that my producers use on a widespread basis. It is an oversight and a good question. All right, that looks like all the questions we have. Dr. Eigenbro, do you want to sort of wrap up the entire series here with a couple slides that we are looking at right now? Right. I just uh, thanks and thanks everybody for your questions and attention. I thought I saw a chat come up where someone was asking about the book um, and this book, Advances in Dryland uh, Farming. Let 
Inland Pacific Northwest is a WSU publication. We have a, we have copies that are can be obtained for free. Um, there's the download link for an PDF, but there's also hard copies, and, and they, people should contact uh, me if they're interested in that. We have them. So I just wanted to say well, we had six of these webinars uh, that covered seven of the chapters out of the twelve. So there's a lot more in the book than has been covered in the webinars. Acknowledging Georgine Yorgi and Chad Kruger, WSU, of Mount Vernon, for the, uh, leading the effort to put this together and editing the entire volume. Elizabeth Kirby and Karen Hills uh, were really important in making sure it was a good-looking product. So finally. The, um, the volume is one of the many outputs of the REACH project, Regional Approaches to Climate Change for Pacific Northwest Agriculture, which is a National Institute of Food and Agriculture funded regional project that is now finishing up uh, after seven years of working together. Uh, you can see a picture of what the team looked like uh, in, its, uh, in its heyday. Um, and it was very important to focus just one output of that project. Uh, and, and many other things. There's a website where you can see those, uh, uh, those outputs. Just um, Google reachpna.org and uh, take a look. Uh, and that includes more, uh, around 200 scientific publications and hundreds of presentations all over the, the region. So that was just a pitch so that you, those who are listening, understand the source of all the work that uh, went into this. And I think that's end for the day. Well, great. Thank you, Sanford and Ian. We appreciate it. Um, again, all of these webinars will be available on climatewebinars.net. And with that, I guess that's it. Thank you very much, Sanford. I had a great time hosting these and I learned a lot and hopefully we can work together again in the future.